Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, welcome back. My name is Glenn Adamson, and I'm the Curatorial Director for Design Miami 2024. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here, and indeed to welcome our guest, uh, Simona Farrison uh, from Forma Phantasma. Uh, he's one half of Forma Phantasma. Unfortunately, Andrea Tamarki, his partner, was not able to join us, um, but is here very much in spirit. And we also have Caroline Bianco from uh, uh, from Perrier Jouet, and they're going to be walking us through an amazing collaboration uh, that has just been completed at what is called the Island of Diversity, which sounds like something from a wonderful film, but is in fact a real place um, that we are, we are about to plunge you into. So before we hear from our speakers and have discussion, we are going to sh watch a quick video, which will give you a sense of the project, and then we'll unfold it uh, the philosophy, the aesthetics, the implications of what they've done together. So without further ado, let's watch the film. I'm Simona. I'm Andrea, and together we are a form of Fantasma, a design studio based in Milan. With our practice, we investigate the social and ecological forces that are shaping design. We were fascinated by the test that Perrier Joy is doing related to regenerative viticulture. So for us, that was our starting point of a long process that almost lasted two years. Coabitare is a long-term project, but also a permanent one in the vineyards of Perrier Joy. And the first installment is the Biodiversity Island. Our intention with the Biodiversity Island is to create a house for the living. We design a series of totemic objects made of clay that are um, the fruit of a conversation with a biodiversity and scientific committee that help us to understand what are the best conditions to offer to the specimen. The project has the ambition to host, study and monitor how biodiversity is shifting in the fields of Perrier Joet. With Cohabitare, we really wanted to reconnect species and to understand how through design we could enhance the well-being of the many different creatures living in the fields in Champagne. And of course also reconnecting them and interconnecting them. Coabitare is our joint effort to celebrate and protect nature. This project with Perrier Jouet aims to demonstrate how design can connect with nature. So beautiful. Uh, so uh, we'll see quite a few more images of the project uh, just running behind us as we speak. But first, Caroline, can I ask you to begin and just give us a little bit of background about Perry Jouet's history of commissioning designers. This is a bit of a departure, as we'll hear. But you also have quite a track record of working with people in our field. So could you first say a little bit about that just to set the scene? Yeah, I think the context of this project starts in uh, 1811, the Maison Perrier Jouet. Uh, it's, a, it's a love story. It's a two person. Uh, one was in, really into the champagne, the other one was a botanist. So they were a passion for nature and they have a strong relation into art. Uh, so they built a family house. They used to work with a lot of artists from Art Nouveau. So it was really like the beginning of the, the story. After that, I think we, the, the Maison Perrier Red continues to bring to life this legacy. Um, and we used to invite a lot of artists and designers to collaborate with the Maison Perrier Jouet and to share the, their vision on the questioning between the main and nature. So it was really like the starting point. And uh, when we entered into a conversation with uh, Forma Fantasma, so two years ago, I think, uh, it was, I think, the moment where we need for the Maison another kind of project. We were really into like um, a kind of admiration for the nature, working with the nature, but we were also facing on the vineyard a lot of problematics. So it was, I think, the moment to not just um, share the vision of the nature, but to, to act with the nature. And we should say that you're also personally very interested in this connection between art, design, and science. 
So you're a real innovator in the field on your own, right? Perhaps you could just say a little bit more about your own background. Yes, so previously I was uh, leading uh, an atelier that was uh, that's called Atelier Luma. So it was a research and design lab. So that's true that I think since now many years, I experiment the fact that um, when you would like to, to do projects linked to problematic, environmental problematic, you can't be, um, you can't act alone. So it's a question of putting together the right person, uh, different angles. And I think it's also what I try again to do with the project with uh, Forma Fantasma. It's really a collaborative approach, working with the vineyard, with the maison, with the designer, but also a lot of scientific uh, experts. And is it the research-driven aspects of Forma Fantasma's practice, which are well known, I'm sure many people in the audience will be aware of projects on wood, wool, um, biodiversity and uh, early rubbers and sort of natural plastic uh, resins, that sort of thing. Was that what attracted you to working with Simona and Andrea? Yeah, that's true that I think we were an, a mirror of the, of the way that Forma Fantasma was uh, doing their project. They were designing as an investor of change. And, um, and when, you are when you try to do project linked to environmental issue, seems for the for a lot of people uh, very complex so i think i was quite um passionate about the the way that forma fantasma was doing their project on the way that it was always in the end so simple so easy to understand and i think it was something that we were needed for the the problematic that we were facing to attract also people and to to build a full team uh, linked to also the viticulture regenerative. That's something I'd like to get back to later, this question about simplicity and complexity and design, maybe something we don't talk about enough. So let's hold that thought. Um, but uh, Simona, could you say a little bit more first about the project and what you actually did? We saw a bit of it in the video, obviously, but first describe it for people who haven't encountered it previously. Of course. So um, as Caroline described, the project started two years ago. And uh, Perrier Joet invited us to go to Epernay in France and to see what they are doing with agriculture there. So the starting point was not a brief, but it was actually the witnessing of what they are actively doing in terms of agriculture. And they, uh, Perrier Jouet is engaging with a different form of cultivating the land called regenerative viticulture. And this entails a planting of different floras um, together with vines on the land so that these plants contribute to the soil and uh, equally to the biodiversity in the area because when you have a highly cultivated area only with wines of course the biodiversity decreases. so this is a way of uh, of course do something that is beneficial for the wines but it is also beneficial for other other species it also maintains uh, more um, humidity in the in the earth. So there is the need of less water. So it's a it's a very different ways of cultivating the land. So when we saw that, um, our first reaction was to say that we did not want to do any design intervention or installation anywhere all over the world, if not in Champagne, because it, that's where the intervention and the real change is happening. And. Uh, we should have found together different ways of sort of taking these ideas all over the world without the needs of shipping complex infrastructures and elements um, because it would have been counterintuitive considering the ecological initiative uh, or complexity of the project. So um, the main idea of Coabitare is to do an intervention in the land that is of course becoming a landmark in the area so to be able to engage in conversation with the local community, because many people don't know regenerative viticulture, they don't know this change, so it's important to share what Perrier Jouet is, is doing. Also for people that might be, sorry, also for people that might be um, not aware of what this is. And this is the first installment, but in the years to come, there will be also the restoring of an architecture um, so to create sort of a real venue where uh, activations can, can happen. 
So before we get onto the ceramic elements that you created, which are so beautiful and intriguing, um, could we just have one more bit of explanation about the word regenerative? So that might be a bit obscure, but my understanding of it at any rate is that when we think about regenerative agriculture here, viticulture, what you're trying to do is leave the land in a better state than it was before you arrived or if it were not being cultivated. So you're actually doing better than carbon neutral, better than zero impact, you're trying to actually improve the land, as it were. Yes, exactly. And it is about uh, making sure that what you're doing is not only beneficial for your own business, but it is also beneficial for the ecology at large. So actually, it is uh, looking at production of any kind from a more expansive perspective that uh, and understanding that the ecology of producing something is not only about what is good for the final outcome, it is that for sure. That's still the objective of Prix But it is also about the quality of life or the other species that contribute to the well-being of, you know, humanity, essentially. Right. Okay, so let's talk about these totems, which is my word, not yours, um, these ceram vertical ceramic yes. elements. So these, of course, ring all kinds of bells for those of us who know our design history from, I suppose, ancient columns, Doric temples, all the way through, let's say, Atreus Sotsas's uh, well-known ceramic totems from his radical design period. Um, how did you approach the use of this local clay resource? What uh, led you to derive the forms? And also, what did they actually do? Yes. So first, I have to explain. So the, 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 the intervention is called the Biodiversity Island, because in fact, that's a plot of land which is not super huge, but it's in any case relevant in the context of a highly cultivated land where plants have been planted and, it, and the land is left almost uncultivated so that specimens that struggle to live in highly cultivated land, they can find a refuge in there. So our intervention is actually about um, defining where this plot of land is to indicate that humans should not step in. So, but of course we didn't want to create a, a full barrier. So in the, following the philosophy of regenerative viticulture, we design these elements that are signaling this perimeter, but also they have been designed in conversation with uh, scientists from the team of Paris Joe and beyond to uh, actually become some of these modules, only a, only a few, uh, designed in such a way they can actually host nests for pollinators within their structure. So the, the, the columns you're, you talked about, they are made of 74 modules, 32 of them, they have cavities and, and cells that are designed in such a way that wasps, uh, but other kinds of pollinators, bees, and so on, they can actually nest in them. Um, in terms of its design, of course, the design is a, a, an outcome of a conversation with, uh, with scientists that sort of gave us indications of what it was possible to do or what was uh, not possible. But the reasoning behind using clay, it's because, of course, clay, it's essentially earth. So it is a way to go back to the essence of, of also what Perrier Joe does, because it's, uh, you know, it's all about the terroir, it's all about what comes from the land. Um, and it was also suitable material because it is, it is porous, it lets humidity go through. So it is also, in terms of uh, its materiality, is, uh, it, it's working for the purpose that we, we had in mind to use it for. Mm -hmm. So Caroline, can I ask you about that concept of terroir? which I suppose is a way of asking what Perry Jouet is getting out of the project and what you're learning. But I, if there's one term in French that people know that has to do with wine, that's it, right? Terroir, the land, the character of the soil, how it affects the flavor and the quality of the product. But here you have this situation where the terroir is subject to climate change like everywhere. So you have this, as you put it, a problematic that you're trying to navigate. How does bringing form of phantasma in actually help the company to address that concern? Yeah, I think we are. We know uh, now since uh, many years that things are moving. So, uh, for example, I, I had like conversation with the cellar master Severine, uh, who was mentioning to me that uh, previously uh, we used to uh, harvest, the, harvest the wine in another period. Things are moving, but drastically, it's like months of uh, difference. So um, I, th I think it was very important for the Maison Perrier Jouet that we can keep the quality first of our champagne. 
and also to make sure that all the people on the territory, because in the end, you know, that's, that's um, kind of parcel of land, but we are all close to each other. So, you know, that's also a question of making something that could have a, a positive collective impact. And, um, because the insects, of course, don't know whose property course, they're on. Of right? course. Yeah. Still, it's, a, it's a landscape where everything is linked to each other. So I think that was uh, important to, um, because the most complicated, to be, to be honest, is to be the first one. You have to prove that things could work. You know, uh, in the Champagne, each meter square of estate costs really a lot. You have to be, uh, in a way, uh, productive. Uh, so, um, so I think we have to create a project that will be experimental, but in the same time, we have also to find a way to communicate simply, and also to make sure that this project will continue to evolve, that we could have also a way to measure the impact. So that was very, a very important uh, subject that we will continue to work on. And not only measurements with like numbers and uh, with a scientific way, also measurement that all the people on the territory who are not scientists could feel that something is happening. Okay, so this is so interesting because effectively what you're saying is that the traditional concerns of design, which have to do with aesthetics, making a business case for a product, and then also communication, so how do we signal to the wider world what's happening and its value and meaning? Those are all being transposed into this, I won't say post-human, but this expanded context where nature is the client, we could say, or as, as much the customer as humans are. So, Simona, this is obviously an extremely important concern for Forma Phantasma. It's animated your practice from the beginning, so I know that there's no simple answer to this question. But can you say a little bit about how Forma Phantasma thinks about working with nature and for nature, rather than the kind of biomimicry or, or yes. yeah. the kind of iconography that we might associate with Art Nouveau, which is again, very important to the history of Paris Jouet, you're actually in some way partnering with nature here and in your other projects. Could you say a little bit more about that? So um, we have never been interested in biomimicry. That's really something that we don't care about. We don't, uh, it's not we don't care. We just think it is sort of a limited ways of, of, of working with, with the landscape or what we call nature, uh, very often still based on the idea of exploitation. So um, I'm not saying that what we're trying to do here is working with nature or collaborating with other species, because that's also quite of an arrogant position. What do I know as much as I can try of what another species needs? It's also really difficult to do it with humans. So, but I think the attempt is what is important. I think it's putting you in the position of trying to understand. It's, it's, I would say it's very similar to what happens um, also between humans of different, uh, of different cultures, but also between men and women that are you know, born biologically, men and women. It's about trying to, uh, to put yourself in the position of the other. It's about exercising empathy. This does not, this does not mean you are the other. You know, you can, you're not the same person as the other in front of you, so we will never be understanding fully what other species uh, needs, but what we can do is exercising empathy. And that's what this uh, project is about. And also posing the, an attention that on, on another thing that, which is equally very important for design, when we think about design, we always think in terms of user. We always have a user in front of us. We design for a user, but it's an illusion that there is one user. Whenever we produce something industrially, we also have the laborers involved. That's also a user. We have uh, the people distributing the product. That's a user. We have the people extracting the materials to make the products. That's a, equally a user. So the, ex the, the, the ecology of design is complex. And what we're trying to do here is remember that when we produce, it's, we don't do that in solitude, but we do it together with other species. Can I just push that a little bit further? And this, again, is a, com a conversation or a question that's prompted by your larger practice, as well as this particular co collaboration. But it strikes me that one of the things that's implied in Form of Phantasma's whole oeuvre 
is that you're operating from a position that tries to minimize the ego of the studio and tries to avoid imposition of form or at least to control the kind of um, ripple effects of that. And yet at the same time, you're very well known for a very aesthetically refined approach. So it seems to me that there's maybe not a contradiction, but a very important creative tension in form of Phantasma's work between, if you like, form giving and this kind of acceptance or um, receptivity. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. I mean, um, I think we equally design, uh, love design as much as we hate it. So we don't design only based on love. We also design based on hate and things we want to change. And we always are frustrated when we have the feeling there are certain cliches in place. And we're not here to discard all cliches in place. Maybe we are our own cliche too. But um, it is important when you do design to be aware of how expansive it is. The reason why we are interested in design is because it's a discipline that sits between economic interests, social innovation, ecological justice, um, economic injustice equally. And this uh, complexity of design is what we are interested in. Um, it is very much an applied discipline. We're never working from a position of, uh, we're, now, we're now working in academia. So the world we live in is not the ideal world. It's, it's, we work within the world, we, we work within the contradictions of economy, within the contradictions of um, ethical questions of what design really is and what it can do and what it cannot do. But we are interested in it because of that. So we embody also those contradictions. So we are people that are out of, you know, the discipline of design it is about giving a form and we are not um, escaping that. We are doing that, but with the awareness that our job is not a formal exercise. It's much more than that. It entails form, but it is not only that. And Caroline, do you feel that uh, from the company perspective, there's a parallel situation that you're navigating? Obviously, it's a business. It needs to make profit, etc. But you're also, of course, trying to be a steward of the land, steward of a legacy. There's something, I suppose you could say, ephemeral and ineffable about the business that you're in. So how, when you hear Simone talking about that and those contradictions, how does that translate on the Paris Jouet side? That's true that we have a huge history with Art Nouveau. That could be a, a point. But I think it's not really a question of aesthetic. It's more a question of being meaningful. So um, I think behind all the, the Art Nouveau uh, period, you have also a lot of uh, different elements that are still very uh, actual. And, uh, and so I never really uh, look into the, I'm not a good expert on the aesthetic, to be honest, but uh, I think when a project is, is linked to a territory, when it's humble, when you have like uh, uh, authenticity, uh, when the project is able to speak to uh, everybody, uh, I think there is a kind of beauty behind. So um, it's the only thing that I can say. I think for Perrier Jouet, uh, that's be that beauty is not only on the aesthetic, but more on the, the principle and the message that we can carry. You know, we were talking yesterday, um, some of you might have been in attendance, uh, this talk that we had with Yves Bahar, who's working with Rosanave. Mm -hmm. And just to summarize very briefly, they're making an experimental, ecologically friendly super yacht, which almost sounds like a contradiction in terms, but you know, it's completely paved with solar panels and lined with cork and you know, basically as ecological as you can make a yacht. And they were making the case that even in this extremely elite and rarefied field, one could have genuine innovation and impact, partly by using it as a kind of research and development space, almost like NASA sending a spacecraft up. And I wonder whether you feel that Perrier Jouet, which is also arguably an elite brand in some respect, or a luxury brand of, of, of sorts, could function in that kind of research and development mode. I think uh, that's really important to uh, continue to make uh, research. I, I think that that's essential uh, for, the, for the brand. And we are making research on every level at the Maison Perrier Jouet, not only on the territory. And, um, but after that, I think what we try to do is to, uh, to stay humble. Uh, I think all the projects that we are doing stay 
uh, on the perimeter in a scale that we can um, how can I say that to um, in a human scale so in the way that we can like make progress step after step that we can also see when we are going too far when you know it's like uh, Experimentation is adjustment every time. And it's putting all the people around the table. Sometimes it's new person will give you like another uh, feedback and we need to be agile also to uh, make modification. And I think for with Cohabitari that is also the idea of for the moment keeping the project at, at a human scale. Of course we have desire and I think, you know, there is like many uh, problematic link to um, the, the climate into the viticulture everywhere in the world. So uh, if we find a solution, the idea is to share it with others and to be able to duplicate what we are doing in the Champagne to other uh, countries. But at the beginning, I think it's always interesting to, to keep a scale that you can uh, you can uh, maintain. Well, it's just interesting too because Champagne is, again, speaking about terroir, it is a defining place and it does have this ripple effect on the international wine business so it is kind of uniquely positioned to create that kind of um, broader impact I, I guess Simone I'm very curious to hear what you would say about this I know Forma Phantasma gets many more invitations to do things than you can possibly say yes to and you did say yes to Perry Jouette so I assume that you did feel like there was a real potential for innovation here uh, how do you frame the legitimacy of that, of using a collaboration like this with a company like Perry Jouet as a form of change agency? Yes, so um, the possibilities and the limitations of the design disciplines are infinite and equally in quantities. We, uh, as designers, when the discipline originated, we have always been working in conversation with a commissioner. And we, ne we never shied away from that position. Actually, the idea of full autonomy, I don't think it is th that interesting in design. Um, I think uh, design is interesting because it is not fully autonomous, but it's... Something you said to me last night, which really stuck with me, so I just want to repeat it, is that there's nothing more boring in design than sitting down at a desk with a blank piece of paper and drawing whatever you want. Yes, I find it really boring. I don't even know where to start because I find it contextless. And instead, we, uh, as much as our work very often ends up in museums or in a, in a luxury company and so on, but it, it is a constant reflection about reality, not about uh, um, the, exclu the, ex the exclusive power of imagination. It's not that at all. I, whenever I hear a designer says like, what I want to do is express myself, and I'm thinking like, well, change, yeah, go and do something else. There is a, le a level of self-expression in design, but it is a lot about actually reflecting, reacting to the world. And I think artists self-reflect, I mean, a work of self-expression can also be, in any case, a reflection of the world. I don't want to say that they are mutually exclusive, but, yeah. what, but what I want to say regarding the, your questions about elitism and, and, um, and, and again, the tension there is in, in this, um, we know when I, when I was growing up and I started to engage with design and I started to do that in the very early stages when I was 15 or 16 in Italy, I engaged with work that I never owned. I engaged with the works of Enzo Mari and, and he was a, you know, a leftist and completely a Marxist in his position and I could engage with his ideas without the need of acquiring what he was producing with companies. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a power of ideas that surpasses the ownership of things. Sure. And uh, this is not to say that uh, this, this excuses everything, but if there is something that you can achieve with companies that have also economic power, is of, often much bigger than what you can achieve with uh, you know, smaller companies that very often they don't have the possibility to do that. What we do as, as designers is not par partnering with people that only have economic power, but with people we can engage in a conversation with. Right. So we started many times co uh, collaborations that never ended anywhere because we felt we were not um, establishing a dialogue, but rather we were told to send a drawing. Mm -hmm. And again, we're not going to do that mm -hmm. because it's 
boring and it's um, I think it's also extremely um, disempowering of design to think that what you can do is to say can you please send me a drawing of a chair it's what is that about really yeah so uh, this is, seems like a good moment to return to something you said earlier Caroline which is about complexity so if you will forgive me I have a, a private theory about the world which is that we have shifted from our key political conflicts being over traditional issues of left, right, like Marxist versus capitalist, et cetera, to a problem over complexity itself, where there is such a flood of information, opinion, multivariable uh, implication that it feels terrifying, unmanageable, et cetera, and that some of our political forces in play are trying to clamp down and repress that complexity and others are embracing it and basically think of it as a kind of liberating expansive domain and i think that's the new political conflict line of the 21st century um this is just a pet theory but i do what I, it really struck me when you said that earlier that design and i suppose by implication for you a design agent working inside a company has the possibility to take a very complex scientific reality and communicate it in a simple way. And I would love to hear you say a bit more about that strategic advantage or kind of leverage. Yeah, I think for me, uh, the key first is to, um, to start with uh, what you are doing and what you can handle. Uh, so I, I was talking about the, the scale. I think that's uh, something that is really important because you can, you need to adapt, you need to understand. After that, I think when we start the conversation with Forma Fantasma, what was really interesting, it was the, the first uh, visit to uh, Epernay and the Maison Belle Époque, and the way that they understand the, comp their, the complexity. So they were there also to draft the right question. And I think that that's what I, prefers, especially when uh, I'm working with designer, is there the way that they understand something that we used to handle like every day, the way that they making their own, and the way also that after that we can build from that. Because you know, you know it's like when you are working with a designer and a, a scientist, the scientist is directly like that, you know, is like thinking in his, in his own way, he had his own objective. And when you put a designer in dialogue with a scientist, suddenly something is reopening. And so, um, so I think for me, what I will try to do in the future, I think for the, the Maison Perrier Jouette, it's to continue to open this kind of dialogue, because I think that it's at that moment that things became not more complex, but more simple. Yes. Um, I, I suppose the consequence of increased complexity is that you have more specialization. So the scientists might be very, very focused on a particular question. Yeah, and I think design, you know, the, the skills of a, of a designer, it's like a fantastic also uh, mediators, you know, he's taking like all the information in a, in a way, he combine them and transform them in a, in, a, in the right question, in the, I don't know, in any kind of form. But I think, you know, that's why when you have all this complexity, the role of a designer could be like so interesting. Simona, what do you think about that? Like the, the lateral thinking of design as a solution to the problem of complexity? Well, um, I think because when you're trained as a designer, what you're always looking for is a solution. Sometimes it can also be a trap, but that's a very good training in any case, because you're looking for possibilities within problematics. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an extremely uh, interesting position that can be helpful also for, um, I think, people like scientists, not all scientists work in academia, but many do, that because the academic system, I'm very happy that the academic system is as it is, there is um, much less, there is not a possibility to be an author fully. So of course you are not supposed to express opinions in a paper, in a scientific paper, or to address what are the implications of what you are writing fully. Some scientists 
do. Now, many uh, scientists are working within uh, almost an exercise in, in, um, in accountability more than anything else. And I think when, they, when you take that knowledge and you put it in the context of a conversation with designers, suddenly you open up an opportunity which is not only for designers, but it is also for other disciplines that can take the, the consequences, the implications of their research and apply it. Basically, we designers are working, you know, the terms applied artists has always been interesting when thinking about design because it is the idea that you, you have a certain set of knowledge, but you apply it. And similarly, that space is extremely interesting for, for science too. And, and I'm saying this because to go back to your questions regarding complexity, I think um, these sort of collaborations, they are interesting because you can exercise complexity. It's not only about theorizing complexity, it's not only about mapping complexity, but it's also trying to exercise it in the world, which also means sometimes narrowing it down, simplifying it, maybe sometimes um, making it more narrow, maybe making it more simple, but it is an exercise in reality, and I think that's extremely useful. Weirdly, it's kind of like a cuvee, right? You're taking this incredibly complex landscape and history, and you're turning it into one drink that you can taste, right, and has this kind of incalculable complexity in it, famously difficult to describe. You know, it's almost comic how people try to describe wines with words, right? Yeah, if it's like the cuvee, I think uh, we have to say that time is a, is a very important ingredient. Yes. So, and nature operates with its own rhythm, so uh, I think that's also something that we need to uh, take in consideration, that is really also part of uh, what we are doing. But Simone, I wanted to ask you, um, you, you said something very interesting, which is that scientists, for very good reason, feel like they have a weight of accountability and so they don't offer their opinions. They might very much limit their discussion even of the implications of what their own research um, might create in the world. And that, that, that moving into a conversation with a designer like yourselves, you and Andrea, might open up some conversational space. But then there's another way of looking at it, which is that design has a unique responsibility of its own. So it's not just a space of freedom. It also ha imposes its own ethical quandaries. So how do you think about the responsibility of design as opposed to the responsibility of science in that dialogue? Um, now we're asking the hard questions. No, it is hard. Um, I'm wondering if they are that different, honestly. Maybe they're not that different. Maybe it is about... Um, I think when you act within a profession, you are confronted with many ethical questions that are even bigger than when you are um, an individual citizen. So I think when... I think a lot of our attitude towards design comes from the ethical questions that are implicit in the act of design. And I think that what is maybe the biggest difference with science is that uh, scientists that work within academia um, is that we don't necessarily are taught any specific rules in regards of how to um, credit the work of others, how to um, sort of prove what you're saying, it's much more intuitive in a way, the, the field of design. While I think the scientists have a much, you know, you're educated within a very clear system of, with ethical standards. Um, sorry, can you repeat? Can you remind me again your question? I think I got lost into it. Well, no, I think you're saying something very interesting about it. It's really about the responsibility of the designer as yes. an actor in the field and whether you feel like the profession has a unique construction of responsibility yes. of its own. Yes, I, we do feel that enormously. But what is complicated of design is that you're pulled between very different interests. So even now talking in this work, we have to be honest, of course, there are economic interests behind this project. You know, it is about, at the end of the day, the promotion of champagne. But even while doing that, you can still try to do that but taking it back to a core, which is actually a deeper belief on a, on, a, on a larger good, I would say. Okay, so this leads me to my last area of questioning, which is inspired by the theme of the fair, which is blue sky. 
So I, I took it to heart what you said earlier, Simona, about there being nothing more banal than the idea of the unfettered an imagination and that if it's only the open horizon, then we have nothing really. Um, however, it does strike me that whenever you interact with the sky, you're also standing in a specific place. So in fact, what's happening is a kind of triangulation between yourself and the open celestial firmament and then where you might be going, right? So there's always this kind of interesting geometry in your mind, whether you're conscious of it or not. And it makes me think about the question of the future um, and how these moments of release into a, an imaginative, let's say f more free space, not a completely free space, but a more free space than might exist in science or might exist in a marketing department or a financial spreadsheet, what that does. So Caroline, maybe we could begin with you. Would you care to engage in a little bit of future casting of where this project might be leading you, how you're thinking about commissioning and partnerships at Paris Jouet, given this experience? What do you think you might be up to in 10 years time? That's a good question. Um, I think, you know, the project is not uh, finished for the moment. Huh? We uh, still have a lot of work, so uh, it's difficult to answer like fully to your question. Uh, of course, that is really, I think, the beginning uh, of a long, long conversation and um, an experimentation on biodiversity. I think, of course, in the Champagne, we have a destination that is the Maison Belle Époque. Uh, but I think the Cohabitare project will be in the future another kind of destination. Um, I'm actually working with the teams to, uh, and also for my Fantasma uh, to see what could be uh, the programming of that kind of uh, project. Uh, I would like really that we work together on the, a way to um, make sure that uh, scientists, but also school and the public could enter into the conversation of biodiversity. It's not, um, it's never, I think it will work only if it will be like collective. So I think more people will participate to the project. I don't know how <laughs> at the moment, but um, the more interesting the project will be. So uh, we are we're, we're thinking about uh, um, residency uh, program, but also perhaps a biodiversity prize and some uh, other ideas like that, but uh, difficult to tell you at the moment. But sort of expanding the uh, reach of the program partly by making it more interactive and accessible and yeah, involving. And we, we also need to continue yeah. to, uh, to work on the project and to uh, see the results and to adapt things. So, uh, it's, uh, it's a long, long process. I think that's quite different from what I used to see with collaboration with um, brands and designers, because normally, you know, it's, uh, we try to, uh, companies try to have a short period. Uh, what we would like to offer is long-term collaboration. When it's experimental, you know, you need time also to, uh, mm. to, com com to design and also to produce and to, um, yeah. Yeah, okay. And so, Simona, um, last question to you along similar lines about where you see Forma Fantasma going. I will say um, this is an exciting thing that we have, of course, your work here at the fair, so both in the collector's lounge and also there is, I think I'm right in saying, the very first piece of a new body of work that you'll be showing at Friedman Benda, um, one of our regular exhibitors here at the fair, uh, which will be this spring in New York. So that's obviously a near-term project. Um, Thinking more broadly, where do you see the trajectory of Forma Phantasma over the next five, 10 years? Five is too short. <laughs> Basically, we already know where we are in five years. But 10 years, I think what we hope for our office is to um, continue developing research work that are more independent and to manage to take that research and reapply it for commercial clients and to somehow uh, move I think in the next 10 years of our work should really be to prove the deeper implications of our the work we developed so far and to see how that can translate it to reality. It's proving ourselves, essentially. So does that include a kind of recursive 
exercise of studying the the results of your own past projects? No, I would say it's much more intuitive, but I can okay. make some examples. We we did the work uh, a few years ago that was presented in the form of an exhibition, but it was much more than that at several galleries, and it had to do with timber industry and how that is designed. And then we established conversations with Artec, the Finnish company. We somehow reapply that research within the company. So it's almost as if we are an independent research and development team that can work within a company. But we started doing these works more recently, and I hope we can establish a few fundamental works where we can prove how that ways of thinking, that ways of working can actually work in reality. Right. Okay. It's so interesting because if you don't mind me complimenting you in front of an audience, I, I really feel that of all the studios operating globally right now, if we're just thinking about methodology, I think Forum of Phantasma has done the most work in that area and is the most, arguably the most innovative and in lots of different ways. But I can imagine that for you, it's um, it must be quite remarkable to be inside it. I remember you were saying to me last night that often things make complete and absolute sense when you're inside the studio. And then when you take it outside, even into a collaboration like this, sometimes it gets tested in a different way. And it's like, does it still make sense? Yes, I think it also makes sense, but we also made peace with that. We always have the feeling whenever we look at uh, the work of even the greatest designers, uh, very often their thinking is much more radical than what they've achieved. And I think that's just part of an understanding that we are not working in solitude, but it's also generational changes that needs to happen. So it's not only about us, it's also about all the other people that will come after us and who, everybody who came before. Yeah, well, this conversation has been recorded and will be online, so maybe people in 50 years will have a look at it and have their own thoughts that we can't guess at. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, would anyone like to ask Carolina and Simona anything, or indeed me? Do you have any questions or comments? The floor is open. Yes, here in the front. Um, I know that you said that you can't really know the needs of other species, but you're kind of doing your best to do that could you speak a little bit more on like what the needs that you think you're meeting with this product yeah so um ideally I, I would like to see to talk about this in the in the larger spectrum of how the full project will develop in the next years because this is a uh, this is the first part of a, of an intervention in the field that is composed of three areas but um First of all, uh, this is, I think what, what mostly the work is doing is uh, extending the philosophy is already there in the fields and materialize it in a way that is understandable for others. First, then, so first it is doing that. In terms of what this is doing for pollinators, it is simply something we've been discussing with the scientific committee. So the modules are designed in such a way that pollinators can find um, a nesting surface for for them. Uh, and there are three different modules that are designed in three different ways. So for instance, wasps, they can, they need their own space. So for instance, the modules are designing with different cavities within the modules. So that for instance, if, if a colony is nesting in one module, it is not entering conversation or in contact with the other so that there are separate cells. There are other modules that have earth in it because some pollinators like to excavate their own nest within the, the modules. So uh, we have to see if this is actually contributed to, to anything, but for sure it is providing a possible nest for, for, this, uh, for these species, which are capable of finding their own ways where to, to nest. But the more the landscape is becoming um, uh, uh, anthropic, so designed by, by man, the more uh, spe uh, species tend to struggle to find nests. Uh, even the way we build architecture nowadays is uh, using materials that are meant to be uh, isolating the interior of the architecture to the exterior, and many birds and, 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 um, 
and uh, insects struggles to find surfaces where to, to nest. So this is, a, in a way, a little response to that, but it will also move on to uh, other interventions in an architecture that is there in the field close to the biodiversity island that we are going to restore using this same sort of philosophy. And one part of the architecture will also fully not be for humans. So because there is very little land that can be left for other plants in Champagne, because of course it's a limited piece of land and everything is cultivated. So plants will be planted within the architecture to allow other specimens to be part of um, the biodiversity of the, of the area. And yeah, welcome. I suppose we didn't mention the, the title of the project literally means living with. Yes. And so it, it, there's a very interesting kind of poetics in that the project is on the one hand a barrier or a fence almost, and, and it's also architecture for bugs. <laughs> um, and it's also columns and a kind of standard. So there's this very interesting play between living with and also respectful distance. Yes, of course. I mean, I guess living with, I mean, we're all living with each other, but not really in the same apartment. So <laughs> I guess it's a bit the, the same thing that it's about understanding that living together doesn't mean to necessarily get along fully, yeah, yeah. Um, but respecting boundaries. Yeah. I guess it is about consent in a way. <laughs> consent, yes. In a way. Exactly, exactly. Well, you know, when you live in an apartment building in New York, isn't it amazing you can live 10, 20 feet from people your entire life and you never even see them, right? So it's also about that sense of awareness and a kind of permeability, but, but not allowing that to become dystopian. Indeed, indeed. I mean, I think it, it, you always need spaces of aggregation and spaces for isolation. It's a bit the same thing. Right, okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Just wait for the microphone, if you don't mind. Thank you. I, <clears throat> I really appreciate you uh, thinking about the aesthetics and the lives of other creatures, other beings. I think that's very important for artists and designers. And I think that we are very close to kind of a breakthrough in communication with other species that I think will happen in a few years. It'll happen probably through AI. It's probably the real reason AI is actually interesting, is it will give us pattern recognition and once we can have conversations, we can not only understand the needs of other species, but also that they have an aesthetic sensibility that we are either destroying or not thinking about. And I think it's a very big thing that will happen. And I think what you're doing is fabulous. And I wonder if you think about the aesthetic lives of other creatures and even the art making of other creatures, the, that they design things and make things. Yes, thank you for your questions. I completely agree with you with what you said about artificial intelligence, which I find it appalling for many reasons, but I also find it really interesting in, in applied research. I think that's completely and, and a pattern recognition. Um, so I completely agree with you. Um, I never really thought about necessarily uh, the um, sort of the living, the way uh, other creatures live in terms of aesthetics. But I have to say that very often we don't think about our own work in terms of aesthetics, which does not mean that it's not there at all. It's just that it's much more of an intuitive side of our work. Um, there are works where, to, I mean, I said it's intuitive, but it, it does not mean that we are not aware of what our aesthetics says. But it's a very intuitive part of our work. And so um, also when we look at other creatures that create aesthetics, we also have an intuitive relationship with it. At the end of the day, we are now rationalizing a process which is, by the act of speaking, that is much more complex. So before it was a bit of a provocation when I mentioned that I find it really boring when it's only about imaginations and self-expression, but imagination plays a huge role in what, we, in what we do. It's just that the majority of people, the way design is discussed, it is only exclusively in terms of uh, authoriality, individuality, and self-expression. And that's not really what we're interested in doing. Well, and I suppose when it comes to artificial intelligence, there might be many ways of breaking it down, but one way would be that the bad AI replaces our imagination and the good AI extends it. And that might be one criterion we should bring to that question. I will say, 
if you are here in Miami on Friday, I implore you to come back because we're going to have what I think will probably be the most significant conversation ever held on design and AI. We have Tony Fidel, who's just joined us on the panel, um, who's the founder of Nest, some specialists from MIT and Paola Antonelli from MoMA, and we'll all be gathering together to talk about AI and its implications for the design field. So um, I think of everything that uh, is still coming up in the talks program, that would definitely be one not to miss. Also at two o'clock, if you are still here, um, we have a great panel discussion about design and wellness. So we'll be talking with Jonathan Leary and some others hosted by Kohler on that subject. So that'll also be very interesting. And I think we'll have a lot of connections to what we've talked about here as well. Um, the role of botany, for example, uh, will be included. Um, but I'm afraid we have to draw it to a close. What a fantastically interesting conversation. Uh, please join me in thanking our two panelists. And thanks for Thank you. Thank you.